Modern engineering wonders. During the 20th century, there were great improvements in engineering technology. These new developments allowed the construction of many amazing tunnels, bridges, towers, and office buildings. For centuries, people had dreamed about the possibility of connecting the island of Great Britain to the mainland of Europe. However, it was only in 1994 that such a link was completed when a tunnel was dug under the English Channel between England and France. The Channel Tunnel, also known as the Channel, actually consists of three separate railway tunnels. These tunnels are about 50 kilometers long. They are located about 150 meters below the bottom of the sea. Obviously, this was an extremely challenging project to undertake. As a result of the tunnel, it is now possible to travel between London and Paris by train, and the trip takes only three hours, of which only 20 minutes are spent inside the tunnel. A suspension bridge is a bridge that is supported by strong wires that hang from tall towers. The world's longest suspension bridge is the Akashi Kaiko Bridge near the city of Kobe, Japan. This bridge is nearly four kilometers long, and the two towers near the middle of the bridge are about two kilometers apart. It took almost 20 years to design this bridge and 10 years to build it. This bridge was designed to withstand extremely strong winds because Japan often experiences windstorms called typhoons. The bridge was also designed to withstand powerful earthquakes, which sometimes hit Japan. At the beginning of the 21st century, the world's tallest freestanding tower was the Canadian National Tower, or the CN Tower. The CN Tower is 553 meters tall. It is located in the city of Toronto, within the Canadian province of Ontario. This structure was built in 1975 as a television and radio tower. Before the CN Tower was built, TV and radio reception in the Toronto area was poor. This was because the TV and radio signals were blocked by the buildings of downtown Toronto. When the CN Tower was built, this problem was solved. Of course, the CN Tower is also a famous tourist attraction. People can ride in the very fast elevators that take them to observation areas, which are at about 350 and 450 meters above the ground. Although the CN Tower is the world's tallest tower, it is not an office building. The tallest buildings in the world are the Petronas Towers in the city of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and the Sears Tower in the American city of Chicago. The Sears Tower, which is 442 meters tall, was completed in 1974. It has 110 floors, and its top floor is the highest office floor in the world. However, the Petronas Towers reach slightly higher, to a height of 452 meters. The Petronas Towers were completed in 1998. Obviously, the late 20th century witnessed some amazing achievements of engineering. It will be very interesting to see what new wonders will be constructed in the 21st century. Anne Sullivan and Helen Keller. The story of Anne Sullivan and Helen Keller is the story of a dedicated teacher and an eager student. The story is very remarkable and inspiring because the teaching was done without sight and without sound. Helen Keller was born in the American state of Alabama in 1880. She was a happy and healthy baby, but before she reached the age of two, she was struck by a severe fever. As a result of this fever, she became both deaf and blind. After her illness, the young Helen Keller learned to use her other senses. For example, she touched other people's hands to figure out what they were doing. In this way, she also learned that people could communicate by moving their lips. Helen could not talk. Instead, she communicated with her family by making sign movements with her hands and body. However, Helen became very frustrated by her inability to see, hear, and talk. She often became very angry and had many temper tantrums. When Helen Keller was six years old, her family took her to see Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, who was an expert on educating deaf children. This man was also famous for inventing the telephone. As a result of this visit, Helen's parents hired a tutor for their daughter. The tutor was a very intelligent deaf woman named Anne Sullivan. At first, it was difficult to teach Helen because she still made many angry outbursts. Gradually, Anne Sullivan gained Helen's trust. One day, Anne began to teach Helen to communicate. Anne took Helen to a well and pumped some water onto Helen's hand. Then Anne used her finger to write the letters W A T E R 
onto Helen's hand. By repeating this, Anne was able to teach Helen how to write the word water. As soon as Helen learned that things could be named in this way, she wanted to learn the names of many other objects and actions. She was curious about many things and learned a great number of words. She also learned to read by using the Braille alphabet. This alphabet allows the reader to feel letters and words, which are represented by bumps on a page. Also, Helen learned to talk by feeling and then copying the movements of people's mouths. When Helen Keller was 16 years old, Anne Sullivan went with her to college. Anne acted as Helen's interpreter, and Helen was very successful in her studies. After her graduation, Helen dedicated her life to improving conditions for the blind, the deaf, and the poor. Anne Sullivan died in 1936 and was remembered as the miracle worker for a triumph in educating Helen Keller. After Anne's death, Helen continued to give lectures in countries around the world and was active in many political causes. She met with presidents and prime ministers and helped to improve conditions for people who were deaf or blind. At the time of her death in 1968, Helen Keller was one of the most admired people in the world. The automobile or car. In many ways, the automobile has been one of the most important inventions of the modern age. People have been able to travel much more freely and across much greater distances than was possible in the past. The automobile, which most people refer to as the car, has also had some harmful consequences, such as pollution and accidents. However, it is clear that life has changed profoundly as a result of the car. Modern cars are very complicated, but the basic idea of how a car works can be described briefly. When the keys are turned in the ignition of the car, this creates a spark that ignites some gasoline vapor inside a cylinder. Then, the rapid expansion of this vapor pushes against a part called a piston. The movement of the piston then causes a turning motion in a shaft that is connected to the wheels. The wheels turn. And the car moves. The invention of the car and the engines used by cars happened gradually in the late 19th century, mainly in France and Germany. In the early 20th century, an American engineer named Henry Ford developed a new way of making cars. Instead of having one worker produce an entire car, he had each worker perform one part of the production. Of many different cars, this system was very efficient and allowed the mass production of cars. The first car to be produced in large numbers was called the Model T. The Model T Ford and other cars that were soon produced in large numbers were cheap enough that many people could afford to buy them. Many new roads were built and paved throughout North America to allow cars to be driven from town to town. People were able to travel much more easily and to visit places that had previously been difficult to reach. Some problems also came with the widespread use of cars. One of these problems was air pollution because car engines burn gasoline, which produces poisonous exhaust fumes. Gradually, new laws and new technology have led to reductions in the air pollution that is caused by cars. Moreover, cars today are much more fuel efficient than they were in the past, requiring less gasoline to travel a given distance. However, this pollution is still a problem because of the many millions of cars that are used each day. Another problem has been car accidents, which have caused many thousands of deaths each year. During the 1960s, some journalists brought attention to the unsafe features of many cars. As a result, the safety of cars has been greatly improved. In addition, the use of seat belts is now required by law. However, car accidents continue to be a serious problem. The future is likely to bring many interesting new changes to the car: improvements in the safety of cars, in fuel efficiency, and in the cleanliness of car emissions are continuing to be made. Also, the increasing use of the car in economically developing countries will probably have important effects upon people's lives around the world. Sexual attitudes and behavior. During the past several decades, 
There have been major changes within most Western countries in people's attitudes towards sex and in sexual behavior. For people who have lived throughout this period, the changes have seemed quite remarkable. Until the early 20th century, people in most Western countries did not have permissive attitudes regarding sexuality. For the most part, young people were expected to wait until marriage before having sexual intercourse. Of course, some premarital sex did occur, and prostitution was not rare. However, sexual behavior was relatively restricted. As the 20th century progressed, there was a gradual trend toward liberalization of attitudes toward sex. However, this trend was greatly speeded after 1960 when the first birth control pills became available. These contraceptive pills made it possible for women to engage in sexual intercourse without much risk of an unwanted pregnancy. As a result, many women were more willing to have premarital sex than was previously the case. Also during the 60s, Western countries were reaching high levels of wealth and education. A new and very large generation of young people was approaching adulthood. And there was a mood of rebellion against traditional norms. There was an increase in the number of people who engaged in sex before marriage, and also a greater openness about such behavior. By the 1970s, sexual attitudes had become quite liberal, and many young people were quite promiscuous in their sexual behavior. However, this pattern reversed somewhat during the 1980s. There was increased concern about sexually transmitted diseases, including AIDS. Moreover, many young women had been uncomfortable with the idea of unrestricted sexual behavior. As a result, sexual attitudes became slightly more conservative during the 1980s and 1990s, although they remained much more liberal than in previous decades. In the early 21st century, most young people in Western countries begin having sex during their high school years, although some people wait until they are considerably older. Some young people are promiscuous, but most engage in monogamous relationships that typically last for a period of several months or a few years. When one relationship ends, another usually begins soon after. This pattern usually continues until marriage. After marriage, most people have sex exclusively with their spouse. However, some people do commit adultery. Sexuality has changed a great deal in recent decades. It will be very interesting to see how people's sexual attitudes and behavior will change in the future. The Mississippi River. The Mississippi River is the longest river within the United States and the fourth longest river in the world. This river holds a special place in American history and literature, and in the imagination of ordinary Americans. The Mississippi River begins in the hills of northern Minnesota, near the Canadian border, and flows southward about 3,700 kilometers through 10 states before draining its water and silt into the Gulf of Mexico. Traditionally, the river is viewed as a natural boundary between the eastern and western halves of the United States. Until the year 1803, the areas to the west of the Mississippi River and the areas around the mouth of the river were claimed by Spain and by France. In that year, the French Emperor Napoleon decided to sell this land to the United States of America. This sale, which is called the Louisiana Purchase, was very important for the United States. By controlling the Mississippi River, the Americans would be able to use it for transporting goods and people in this rapidly developing area. For many years, riverboats were the main method of long distance transportation for people living near the Mississippi. Steam powered boats with large paddle wheels that pushed the boat forward were very popular in the time before cars and airplanes. One of the famous cities along the Mississippi River is St. Louis. This city is known as the Gateway to the West. During the 19th century, St. Louis was the last large town that people would pass through on their way to a new farmland farther west. Today, St. Louis is famous for the Gateway Arch. 
a tall monument that welcomes people to the West. St. Louis is also known as the city where the music known as the blues began. Near the mouth of the Mississippi River is another famous city, New Orleans. In terms of the styles of buildings, New Orleans is said to be the most unusual American city because it is influenced so strongly by Spanish and French traditions. Even today, the traditional festival of Mardi Gras is celebrated in New Orleans each year. New Orleans and the surrounding areas of the state of Louisiana are famous for spicy Cajun food. This style of cooking was developed by the French speaking settlers of Louisiana. The Mississippi River is famous in many stories of American literature. For example, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, which were written by the author Mark Twain, are both set along the Mississippi River. Today, the federal and state governments of the United States are working to preserve the natural environment along the Mississippi River. People recognize the importance of keeping this river healthy and clean. Doctors Without Borders In 1999, the Nobel Prize for Peace was won by the organization known as Doctors Without Borders. This is the English name for the organization, based in Belgium, which won the prize for its humanitarian assistance to people around the world in areas that have been struck by disaster. The fundamental ideas of Doctors Without Borders is that people who suffer from a disaster have the right to receive professional help as soon as possible. The organization helps people regardless of their nationality, race, religion, ethnicity, sex, or political opinions. Also, the assistance provided by Doctors Without Borders is given in response to all kinds of disasters, such as famines, earthquakes, and wars. The people who belong to Doctors Without Borders are experienced medical workers who volunteer their time, effort, and skills in an attempt to help people who are in need. These volunteers include doctors, nurses, surgeons, anesthetists, laboratory technicians, and other medical workers. There are also some non medical volunteers who work for Doctors Without Borders in positions of administration or logistics. Volunteers must first take a course before participating in a humanitarian mission. They promise to abide by a code of professional ethics, and they promise to remain neutral in any conflicts within a disaster area. A mission typically lasts about six months, but the duration varies. The volunteers are insured by the organization, but they are not paid in any way for their work. When Doctors Without Borders began in 1971, it consisted of only a few French doctors who wanted to provide humanitarian aid to people in disaster areas. Over the years, it grew rapidly, and by 2001, Doctors Without Borders had 2,500 volunteers working in 80 countries around the world. They have helped people by providing emergency health care, vaccinations, medicine, Water and basic food, and also by developing improved water and sanitation systems. In, in many areas, Doctors Without Borders has also helped to provide basic medical training to local people. Although Doctors Without Borders remains neutral in any conflicts within a disaster area, the organization does speak out against abuses of human rights. By remaining independent of the influence of governments and corporations, Doctors Without Borders is able to criticize the people and organizations who cause suffering. The volunteers are witnesses who tell the world about the cruelty that is inflicted upon innocent people. Obviously, the work of Doctors Without Borders is extremely important. The volunteers of this organization are brave and selfless people whose efforts have relieved the suffering of millions of people. Chicago Chicago is one of the most famous American cities. Some cities in the United States, such as New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, may be more glamorous, but many people agree that Chicago is the city that best represents the United States. Located in the middle of North America, Chicago has derived much benefit from its geography.
The city's central location has made its O'Hare International Airport the hub for most airlines in the United States. Its location on the shores of Lake Michigan has made it a major port and business center, where the agricultural and industrial products of the American Midwest are shipped overseas. Until about the 1830s, Chicago was a minor trading post, but then it grew rapidly as the most important town in the rapidly developing areas of the Midwestern United States. In 1871, the city was destroyed by a fire. It is often said that the fire started when a cow knocked over an oil lamp. It took about 20 years for the city to be completely rebuilt, but it continued to expand. In 1882, the first skyscraper was built in Chicago. Around the turn of the century, the population of Chicago was growing quickly. Many African American people moved to Chicago from the southern United States, and many immigrants from Eastern Europe also arrived in Chicago during this time. Because of the busy and active atmosphere of the city, an American poet described Chicago as the city of broad shoulders. Chicago became notorious for organized crime during the Prohibition era of the 1920s, when the sale of alcohol was illegal. Mobsters such as Al Capone became rich by smuggling liquor, and many people were killed in conflicts between rival gangs of criminals. But the influence of organized crime later became weaker. In the decades following World War II, Chicago experienced some problems with crime, poverty, and racial conflict. However, the city has recently prospered, and social conditions have improved for many people in Chicago. Compared with other large cities, Chicago is viewed as an affordable place to live with a high quality of life. The city has efficient transportation and many beautiful parks along the Lake Michigan shoreline. Chicago is famous for its many attractions, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Field Museum of Natural History, the Shedd Aquarium, the Sears Tower, and the Miracle Mile Shopping District. Indeed, Chicago is one of the most interesting cities in the United States. Women and the right to vote. In most countries today. People think it is obvious that all adults should have the right to vote in democratic elections, but it was not so long ago that women did not have this right. Only after a long struggle did women gain the right to vote. By the early 19th century, modern democratic forms of government were appearing in the United States, Great Britain, and some European countries. In these countries, most adult men had the right to vote in democratic elections. Some men were denied this right if they were poor or if they belonged to a racial minority group, but gradually this right was extended to all men. It took much longer for women to gain the right to vote. Only in special cases, such as that of a widow who owned land, could a woman be allowed to vote. Many men believed that it was not necessary for women to vote because they assumed that the husband should decide on behalf of his wife. Some men believed that women did not possess the intelligence or the discipline to vote carefully. Some women also believed that women should not be involved in politics, but many others wanted the right to vote. By about the year 1850, some women began to organize in an effort to change the laws regarding women and the vote. This movement was known as the woman suffrage movement. Because the word suffrage means voting, leaders such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton brought attention to this issue and persuaded many people that women should vote. The first part of the United States to recognize women's right to vote was Wyoming in the year 1869. During the following decades, many other states recognized women's right to vote. Particularly in the western part of the country, where women had a high social status. However, the United States was not the first country to recognize women's right to vote at the national level. The first country to recognize women's right to vote was New Zealand in 1893. Soon after, Australia also allowed women to vote, and so did the Scandinavian countries of northern Europe. 
but in countries such as the United States, Canada, and Great Britain, women could not yet vote. Women in those countries struggled to gain the vote. For example, in Great Britain, Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters participated in hunger strikes. During World War I, 1914-1918, women's work efforts were very important to winning the war, and people's attitudes were increasingly in favor of women having the right to vote. Women then gained the right to vote in Canada, the United States, and Great Britain. Gradually, other democracies around the world also recognize women's right to vote. Today, it seems difficult to believe that women were not allowed to vote only a few generations ago. But there is still progress to be made. In most countries, women are underrepresented among political leaders. Perhaps the day will soon come when women are elected as often as men. Charles Dickens Charles Dickens is considered one of the greatest writers in the history of English literature. Dickens wrote his many novels during the 19th century, but those novels remain popular even today. Literary experts admire his genius at describing the lives and personalities of the many characters in his books. Charles Dickens was born in England in 1812. His father was a clerk who worked for the Navy. Unfortunately, his father was not good at managing money, and the family soon went deeply into debt. In those days, people who owed money were sent to prison, and their families were sent to places called workhouses. When Charles' father was unable to pay the debts, Charles was sent to a workhouse, where he had to work long hours, and Charles' father was sent to prison. After a few years, the family regained its freedom, but the experience had a lasting effect upon Charles. As a young man, Charles Dickens worked as a journalist in the law courts and in Parliament, but he soon began writing stories for newspapers. These stories were very popular with the readers. Soon Dickens began writing entire novels for the newspapers. Each month, the newspaper would publish another chapter of Dickens' latest novel. One of Dickens' most famous early novels is called Oliver Twist. This is the story of a young man who is poor and alone in the city of London and becomes involved in criminal activities to support himself. The characters in this novel have a very wide range of personalities, but seem very real to the reader. The book exposed the conditions that faced the poor people of London and helped to encourage reforms aimed at improving those conditions. Perhaps Dickens' most popular novel is A Christmas Carol. In this story, a rich but stingy old man, Ebenezer Scrooge, refuses to give his employee a day off at Christmas and refuses to donate money to help the poor. But while sleeping, Scrooge is visited by ghosts from his past, present, and future. These ghosts show Scrooge how badly he has behaved. When Scrooge wakes up, he becomes a kind and generous man who fully appreciates the spirit of the Christmas holiday. Another famous novel of Dickens is A Tale of Two Cities. This is a story of the violence and upheaval during the French Revolution. The story is famous for the heroic act of sacrifice that is made by one character for the benefit of the others. Dickens was famous as a public speaker, and large crowds assembled to hear his performances. When he died in 1870, he was a very famous man. The novels of Charles Dickens allow the reader to experience the life of 19th century London, showing the poverty and injustice that were so common. The characters of these novels show the range of human behavior, from cruelty and selfishness to kindness and love. It is no surprise that Dickens is viewed as one of the great figures of English literature. Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain Mark Twain was the author of some of the greatest works of American English literature, such as Tom Sawyer, Life on the Mississippi, and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Mark Twain's real name was Samuel Langhorne Clemens. 
He used Mark Twain as his pen name. Samuel Clemens was born in the American state of Missouri in 1835. As a child, he enjoyed many outdoor activities, such as swimming and fishing. When Samuel was 11 years old, his father died, and he began working to help support his family. As a young man, Samuel Clemens began to write stories for newspapers. However, he took a job working as a navigator on the steamboats that traveled up and down the Mississippi River. Clemens greatly enjoyed this period of his life, during which time he gained much knowledge about life on the river. He also learned much about human behavior by observing the many people on the boats and along the river. It was as a result of this time that Clemens began using his pen name, Mark Twain. This name is taken from a term that was used by the men who worked on the river. It is used to describe water that is just deep enough to be navigated safely. The earliest of Mark Twain's really famous novels was. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. This novel describes a boy who engages in much mischief, but who has a kind heart. The story contains several scenes that are quite funny. In one of these, Tom's working at the boring task of painting a fence. He persuades several other boys to help him by pretending that painting the fence is a fun and enjoyable activity. Another famous novel by Mark Twain was Life on the Mississippi. This book describes many interesting characters similar to those that Twain actually observed while working on a steamboat. This story gives the reader a vivid image of the people who lived and worked along the Mississippi River. Probably the best novel by Mark Twain was *The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn*. This novel tells the story of a boy who runs away from his violent father. The boy, whose name is Huckleberry Finn, is joined in his escape by a man named Jim. Jim is a slave who has decided to run away from his owners. Huck and Jim travel north along the Mississippi, hoping to reach the areas where slavery is not allowed. In this story, the reader can experience the moral sense of Huckleberry, who must make several important decisions during the escape. Mark Twain died in 1910 after writing many more novels and many stories of his travels around the world. Twain's works are still widely read today. His books are appreciated for their humor, for their interesting descriptions of life in 19th-century America, and for showing both the good and evil that people can do. Many critics consider Twain to have been the greatest American writer. The Islands of the Caribbean. The Caribbean Sea is the large body of water that lies north of the northern tip of South America. Within the Caribbean Sea are many islands that have played an important role in the history and culture of the Western Hemisphere. By far the largest island in the Caribbean is Cuba. Cuba was formerly a colony of Spain, but became independent in 1902. Cuba became a communist country in 1959 when a revolution overthrew an unpopular government. After the revolution, many Cubans fled to the United States. Today, the American city of Miami in the state of Florida has been greatly influenced by Cuban culture. Tobacco is widely grown in Cuba, and the country is famous for the cigars that are produced in the capital city, Havana. The island of Hispaniola is located just east of Cuba. This island is divided into two countries. In the west is Haiti, where the people speak a variety of the French language that has been influenced by African languages. In the east is the Dominican Republic, where the people speak Spanish. Another important Caribbean island is Puerto Rico. This was previously a Spanish colony, but is now governed by the United States. Many people from Puerto Rico have moved to the mainland United States, especially the New York area. In many other islands in the Caribbean, English is the main language. The largest of these islands is Jamaica, which is located just south of Cuba. Most Jamaicans are the descendants of African people who were brought to work as slaves on sugar plantations. Jamaica is famous as the birthplace of the style of music called reggae, which was popularized in other countries by Bob Marley, 
a famous Jamaican musician. Another important English-speaking Caribbean island is Trinidad. This island is located just north of South America. The population of Trinidad is very diverse. The largest groups of people are descended from people who came from Africa and India, but there are many other nationalities also. Trinidad is famous for a style of music known as calypso, and for musicians who produce pleasant sounds by playing steel drums. There are also many other smaller islands in the Caribbean, each with its own unique features. Many of these islands possess fine beaches and are popular tourist destinations. The warm weather of the Caribbean makes it a popular place for North Americans who must live through cold winters. North American Indians. The first people who lived in North America were the Indians. The name Indians is actually not very accurate because the people are not from India. But when the first Europeans came to North America, they mistakenly believed that they had reached India, so they referred to the people as Indians. In different parts of North America, the Indians had very different cultures and very different ways of making a living. On the west coast of North America, many large rivers flow into the Pacific Ocean. In these rivers is an abundance of fish, such as salmon. The Indians in these areas obtained much of their food by fishing. They lived in settled villages and became experts in carving wood from the tall trees of the area. They carved large canoes for traveling on the rivers and oceans, and they also carved tall totem poles. Totem poles were carvings of various animal or human figures, and often the poles had a mythical or spiritual significance for the people who carved them. Many beautiful totem poles can be seen in cities such as Vancouver or Victoria, in the Canadian state of British Columbia, or Seattle in the American state of Washington. The Plains Indians lived in the central prairie of North America. The various nations of the plains lived by hunting large animals called buffalo or bison. Horses were brought to North America in the 16th century by the Spanish. The Indians who lived in the prairie areas had learned to become experts at riding horses, and on horseback they could hunt the giant herds of bison. They followed the buffalo from place to place. The Plains Indians lived in portable houses called teepees, which were made by sewing together buffalo skins and holding them in place with wooden poles. In the southwestern United States, some Indians lived by farming. In this dry area, the Indians raised several crops, such as corns, beans, and squash. Many of the Indians in these areas lived in large settlements where the houses were made from stone or dried mud. The people were experts at weaving, and they made clothing and blankets that had beautiful artistic designs. Near the eastern coast of North America, many Indians lived by a combination of farming and hunting. These people lived in fortified villages, some of which were inhabited for many years at a time. In some places, they built large earthworks that can still be seen today. In the forests of northern Canada, the Indians lived primarily by hunting, fishing, and gathering. Like the Indians of the prairie regions, they often moved from place to place in search of game animals to hunt. Today, the Indians of North America no longer live in their traditional ways. However, several Indian languages are still spoken by many thousands of people. Also, many Indians in the United States and Canada are very interested in maintaining the cultural traditions of their ancestors. How the First World War Started. During the summer of 1914, many people in Europe felt very optimistic about the future. Modern technology was improving people's lives. Political freedom was gradually increasing in many countries. New artistic styles and scientific discoveries were being made. But later that summer, a terrible war began. In the early 20th century, the various countries of Europe competed with each other in an attempt to be the most powerful country on the continent. 
In each country, many of the political leaders wanted to control more land, more people, and more resources. The First World War began when the Archduke of Austria-Hungary was assassinated. Austria-Hungary wanted to punish the assassin, who was from the small country of Serbia. This led to a serious dispute, and soon other countries were involved. Within a few weeks, a war had begun. On one side were Germany and Austria-Hungary, and on the other side were Russia, France, and Britain. The people in these countries at first welcomed the news of a war. Many people were intensely patriotic and supported the war effort without thinking carefully about the reasons for the war. Some people thought that war would bring adventure and glory to their lives, and they cheered enthusiastically in the streets. After the war started, it soon became clear that it was a terrible disaster. In the western part of Europe, the opposing sides fought many bloody battles. Soldiers on both sides lived in filthy trenches that had been dug out of the ground. Sometimes hundreds of thousands of men were killed in battles that lasted only a few days. In most cases, these battles did not result in large gains or losses of territory. The war continued for more than four years. When the war was finally over, millions of people had been killed. Many people realized that their eagerness to fight against other countries had led them into a great disaster. This disaster did not end when the war ended in 1918. During the next 30 years, there would be many violent revolutions in Europe and a second major war that would be even worse than the first. Today, people in most European countries no longer view other nations as enemies. They have no interest in fighting wars with their neighbors. Instead, they're interested in trading with the other countries and in visiting those countries as tourists. The lessons of the 20th century have reminded people that wars can have terrible consequences. Abraham Lincoln. When historians are asked to choose the greatest presidents in the history of the United States, one of the names most frequently mentioned is Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was president during the greatest ordeal that ever faced the United States: the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809 in the state of Kentucky, but when he was a child, the family moved to the state of Indiana. Abraham's parents, Thomas and Nancy Lincoln, were farmers who were very poor, and they received only a few years of education. When Abraham was only nine years old, his mother became ill and died. About one year later, Abraham's father remarried. As a young man, Abraham continued to work on the family farm, and he also worked as a laborer. During this time, the Lincolns moved to the state of Illinois. Abraham became known to the local people as an excellent athlete and storyteller. He educated himself by reading many books, most of which he borrowed from neighbors. Lincoln was interested in politics, and when he was in his mid twenties, he was elected to the Illinois state legislature. During that time, Lincoln also studied law and soon became known as an excellent lawyer. People called Lincoln "Honest Abe." Because of his personal integrity, in 1842, Lincoln married a woman named Mary Todd. During the 1850s, Lincoln became strongly opposed to the expansion of slavery into the western parts of the United States. Lincoln held several famous debates against a supporter of slavery named Stephen Douglas. In 1860, Lincoln was a candidate in the election for president of the United States. During this election, the issue of slavery and its expansion was very prominent. Lincoln won, but soon after, several of the southern states decided to secede from the United States and form their own country. A few months later, fighting started between those southern states and the federal government, which was supported by the northern states. Lincoln managed the Civil War with skill and determination. Gradually, the North began to win the war. In 1863, Lincoln made the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves. 
Later that year, Lincoln gave his most famous speech, the Gettysburg Address. The Civil War had brought terrible suffering to many Americans, and people were very bitter after the war. But Lincoln wanted the country to become united again, and he urged people to forgive. However, in April of 1865, only months after the war ended, Lincoln was shot and killed by an assassin. Many people, even Lincoln's critics, mourned his death. In the generations that have passed since Lincoln's death, he has continued to be viewed as a great president. Some historians have criticized Lincoln for not being more strongly opposed to slavery, but others have defended him, saying that Lincoln's approach to the issue was realistic and humane. But nearly all historians agree that Lincoln was an honest and brave leader during the most difficult period in American history. Two great musicians, Mozart and Beethoven. Much of the music of 18th and 19th century Europe is still enjoyed by many people. Two of the greatest musicians of that time were born only 34 years apart and actually knew each other for a short time. These great musicians were Mozart and Beethoven. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was born in Austria in the year 1756. As a child, Mozart was a music prodigy. He began composing music before his fifth birthday, and by the time he reached his teenage years, Mozart had already written many symphonies and other musical works. As a young man, Mozart worked as a concertmaster for the Archbishop of Salzburg in Austria. He also traveled to various European cities. When he was in his mid twenties, Mozart moved to the city of Vienna. Mozart had difficulty earning a living, but during this time he wrote some excellent operas and string quartets. Many people did not yet appreciate the greatness of Mozart's music. In his early thirties, Mozart became the court musician for the Emperor of Austria, and during the next few years, Mozart continued to write many beautiful works of music. Mozart died in 1791, but although his life was short, his productivity had been enormous. The beauty, grace, and technical precision of his music is still greatly admired, and he is considered one of the greatest musicians of all time. When Mozart was in Vienna, he met a young musician named Ludwig van Beethoven. Beethoven performed some music for Mozart, who was greatly impressed by the talent of this young man. Beethoven had been born in Germany in 1770, and from an early age, he had displayed a great aptitude for music. Beethoven moved permanently to Vienna in 1792. He studied music under some famous composers and became known for his outstanding skill in playing the piano. Beethoven began to compose more of his own music, and these works became very popular. When in his late twenties, Beethoven began to lose his hearing. He continued to compose excellent music, but he became more withdrawn and performed less frequently. By the year 1817, Beethoven had become completely deaf, and he could no longer perform music. However, his creative genius did not deteriorate. Instead, Beethoven created many of his greatest works despite his deafness. It was Beethoven's influence that began the Romantic era of music, which followed the Classical era of the 19th century. Beethoven died in 1827, but his music remains famous for its beauty and originality. His greatest symphonies, such as the Fifth Symphony, are among the world's best-known works of music. Today, the works of Mozart and Beethoven are still popular among those who appreciate great music. Music fans can look back with wonder at the musical creativity that flourished in Vienna more than two centuries ago. Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart was one of the most famous airplane pilots of all time. She is famous for the impressive travels that she made in her airplane, for the mystery surrounding her death, and for showing that women could perform great feats of aviation. Amelia Earhart was born in the American state of Kansas in the year 1897. 
After graduating from high school, Earhart decided to become a nurse. She worked as a military nurse in Canada during World War I, treating injured soldiers. After the war, she returned to the United States and became a social worker. But in 1920, she saw airplanes in a stunt flying exhibition, and early the next year, she took her first ride in an airplane. It was then that Amelia Earhart decided to become a pilot. Within a few months, Earhart saved her money and bought a small airplane. She flew frequently and improved her skills as a pilot. In 1928, she joined two men in a flight across the Atlantic Ocean. But Amelia Earhart's greatest exploits were still to come. In May 1932, she attempted to become the first woman to fly solo. Or alone across the Atlantic Ocean, she flew east from the island of Newfoundland and faced cold weather, high winds, and dense fog. But she successfully crossed the ocean and landed her airplane in a farmer's field in Ireland. When news of her flight reached the United States, Amelia Earhart had become very famous. Later flights by Amelia Earhart were equally impressive. She became the first person to fly from Hawaii to California across four thousand kilometers of Pacific Ocean. She also became the first person to fly from Mexico City to the New York City area. But in 1937, she planned her most ambitious flight: a journey around the world. On June first, nineteen thirty-seven, Amelia Earhart took off from Miami, Florida. She was accompanied by her navigator, Fred Noonan. They flew east, making stops along the way. Within one month, they had flown across three quarters of the globe, reaching the Pacific island of New Guinea. On July second, Earhart and Noonan took off from New Guinea, flying toward Howland Island. This very small island was over four thousand kilometers from New Guinea and was very difficult to find in the middle of the vast ocean. During this flight, Earhart and Noonan were in radio contact with some ships from the U.S. Navy. However, bad weather made it impossible to see the stars at night, so navigation was very difficult, and the plane became lost. Earhart and Noonan never arrived at Howland Island. The U.S. Navy undertook a massive search, but they never found the lost airplane. Earhart and Noonan had been lost at sea. Amelia Earhart's death was a great tragedy, but she had lived an exciting life that was full of achievements. She had helped to show that very long flights could be made and that women could perform feats of flying that were equal to those of men. Even today, many people are inspired by the courage and endurance of Amelia Earhart. Life in academia. A person like me, who teaches and conducts research at an academic institution, is called academic. The academic institution may be a form of a university, a college, or another post-secondary institution. I have been working in universities for almost eleven years. While enjoying my life in academia, we academics also have a lot of stress and often go through a large amount of stress and frustration. Firstly, we have pressure from the university we are working at to become effective teachers. As the environment, in terms of the society and the marketplace, has become more dynamic and competitive, we as teachers must provide students with necessary skills and knowledge so they can become successful in their society. It requires a lot of preparation, updating of material, self-learning, and continuous improvement in teaching. For these reasons, teaching and learning should complement each other. Secondly, we have pressure from both our university and our academic peers to become active and effective researchers. What we teach to our students in class is no doubt closely related to what we have learned or discovered from our research activities. Thirdly, we have pressure from the university and the community to become good corporate citizens through active participation in various university committees and/or the community at large. A university and the community it belongs to must work closely together to identify common interests and to conduct projects that could benefit both parties.
Even with a high degree of the aforementioned pressures, I love my job as a teacher, scholar, and citizen. There is a high level of freedom and flexibility. Academia is a place to meet new people, to create new ideas, and for everyone in that community to learn. It is a place where both teaching and learning always take place. Education systems in Canada. In Canada, each province is responsible for its own education systems. In general, there are three levels of education systems in Canada: one, kindergarten to grade eight; two, grade nine to grade twelve; three, post-secondary education. Kindergarten may further be divided into junior and senior kindergarten for four and five-year-old children, respectively. Grades nine to twelve students are enrolled in a secondary school system, which is similar to a high school system in the USA. Some cities and towns may have a junior high school system, which accommodates children from grade seven to grade nine. In the province of Ontario, there is grade thirteen, which is a required step for all students who want to attend a degree-granting university. This feature has been unique for Ontario, but the province has decided to abolish it in order to be consistent with other provinces' secondary education systems. By year two thousand and three, when grade thirteen is completely abandoned, the number of students entering a university or college is expected to be almost doubled, called double cohort. Post-secondary education system in Canada includes universities, community colleges, university colleges, and other private institutions providing post-secondary education, such as skill training and continuing education. A university is a standing-alone, degree-granting institution that offers certificates, diplomas, and bachelor, master, PhD degrees. There are about fifty universities throughout the country. Most of which are publicly funded institutions. Some of the most recognized universities include the University of Toronto, McGill University, the University of British Columbia, and Queen's University. A community college offers a variety of programs for students who want to learn technical skills, skills that they can apply to the real world quickly. These programs are usually one or two years in length, emphasizing hands-on experience in a classroom setting. It grants certificates and diplomas, and offers a variety of training courses for people who want to upgrade themselves with the current markets and new technologies. A university college, as the name implies, is somewhat in between a community college and a university. This type of institution is common in British Columbia, the most western province in Canada. It grants certificates and diplomas by itself. However, it is not able to grant university degrees alone, although it often offers all the courses required for a university degree. The curriculum for a degree program is usually designed in conjunction with the university, which actually grants degrees to the university college students. Business education. What is business? A business includes all the activities involved to create and sell a product or service. The most important functional areas of business include accounting, finance, marketing, production operations, and human resources management. Accounting is a field of business that records and reports the flow of funds through a firm on a historical basis and produces important financial statements such as balance sheets and income statements. It also produces forecasts of future conditions such as projected financial statements and financial budgets and evaluates the firm's financial performance against the forecasts. The finance area of business supports a firm in decisions concerning the financing of the firm's business and the allocation and control of financial resources within the firm. Major activities of finance include cash and investment management, capital budgeting, financial forecasting, and financial planning. The cash and investment management activities forecast and manage the firm's cash position and short-term and other securities. The capital budgeting activity involves evaluating the profitability and risk of proposed capital expenditures. The financial planning process evaluates the present and projected financial performance of the firm and projects the firm's future financial needs. 
The marketing function of business is concerned with the planning, promotion, sale, and distribution of existing products or services in existing markets, and the development of new products and new services in order to better serve existing and potential customers with quality products and services. It is also responsible for customer relationship management, product planning, pricing, advertising, after-sales service, and market research and forecasting. The production operations function focuses on the management of all activities concerned with the planning and control of the process producing goods or services. These activities include purchasing of raw material and parts, product design, inventory, manufacturing processes, facilities, location and layout, quality control, and such other logistics as distribution and transportation. The human resource management function involves the recruitment. Placement, evaluation, compensation, and development of a firm's employees, with the main goal of the effective and efficient use of a firm's human capital, the human resources management function supports planning to meet the personal needs of the business development of employees to their full potential and control of all personnel policies and programs. While each of the aforementioned functional areas within a firm used to operate somewhat independently with its own objectives and resources, information and other computer technologies have integrated all business functions within the firm and created something called an internet worked e-business enterprise. Strategic uses of information technology. What is information technology? How can information technology be used in an organization to improve its efficiency? How much investment should an organization make in information technology? What are the business benefits and opportunities an organization may achieve from using information technology? These are some of the most important questions many organizations ask themselves before investing their capitals in information technology. In an academic term, information technology is defined as hardware, software, telecommunications, database management, and other information processing technologies used in computer-based information systems. There are many ways that organizations may view and use information technology. However, in today's competitive business environment, technology is no longer an afterthought in forming business strategy, but it is the actual cause and driver. In other words, for a firm to maintain or improve its business competitiveness, it must use information technology to achieve strategic advantage. Information technology can help a company substantially reduce the cost of business processes and lower the costs of customers or suppliers. Information technology can help a company differentiate its products and services from others. Using information technology, a firm can create new products and services or make radical changes to business processes. A firm can use information technology to manage regional and global business expansion, or to diversify and integrate into other products and services. A firm can use information technology to create virtual organizations of business partners, or to develop alliances with customers, suppliers, and other business partners. Information technology can dramatically improve the efficiency of business processes and the quality of products and services. Using information technology, a firm can build a strategic information base of all the information collected. Some experts argue that use of information technology has become a strategic necessity rather than a strategic advantage, because most competitive advantages don't last more than a few years. Whether the statement is true or not, most companies may not want to wait too long before investing in information technology because it would be tough to catch up later once you get behind your competitors, especially when everyone is playing with newer, better technology.